Welcome to Save Your Sanity, help for handling hijackles, those difficult, toxic, and often disturbing people in your life. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor, and I'm here for you. You'll get the insight, skills, strategies, and support to stop tolerating verbal and emotional abuse, whether it's happening now or it happened to you in the past, maybe by a parent, partner, ex, relative, or even a coworker. Time to take life back, to recover and to rediscover you, your values, dreams, desires, and realize them in healthy ways in healthy relationships. I'm so glad you're here. Hello and welcome to this episode. We're going to talk about divorce today. My guest is going to talk about divorce. I'm going to talk about divorce. And what's important is to understand the impact of divorce and what it can do to a family. Sometimes it completely destroys it, alienates it, other times it doesn't. And in the more mature models, we can have a divorce that does not become destructive or alienating or overly damaging to the children or to the larger family. So you know that you can learn more about my work at forrelationshiphelp.com. So if you're thinking about a divorce or you're going through one and it's very difficult, I'm really happy to help you. But I just wanted to talk a little bit today about what's possible when you have a divorce. And I'm not talking about divorcing a hijackle because that is an entirely other thing. So please go to my podcast, Save Your Sanity, Help for Handling Hijackles, if you want to talk about particularly divorcing a hijackle. Although we will talk a bit about it today. So if you're divorced, I hope that when the dust settled, you did create a new family order that was based on collaboration because many of them are based on division. And if you did not get relationship help you may have benefited from, you may well have divided the family or the the family has become divided even if that wasn't your main intention. And there is a better way. Often when I'm working with families who are experiencing divorce, whether they're in the process of deciding to go or stay or are long gone, there are shifts that occur that benefit from thinking through. And that's where a relationship help really comes in. Again, remember, I'm not talking about hijackles, different matter, different set of circumstances, different result. But some of these things apply. So when there is a persistence of anger and blame and justice and equity or even revenge, the family will remain divided. Some co-parents just don't seem to be able to or be willing to refrain from the mudslinging and the offhanded comments and of course living in the past. So sure, it can be difficult and I'm not for a moment suggesting that divorce is easy for anyone because it isn't. It represents dreams shattered, futures altered, and trust broken. It's difficult, painful, complicated, but the dust can settle. The situation can be carefully assessed and reassessed, and good decisions can be made. They're in the best interest of the children. So did your divorce divide families? Did it just happen? Did you create it? Did you let it? In some instances, of course, the family's divided for good reason. One parent is unwilling or unable to provide a stable environment for the children and they depart by their choice or by court order. And if your children are used as pawns in an unending game you perpetuate, your family is divided and you like it. But if your family is divided because you cannot let go of past issues, that's a choice. And, you know, I've done a lot of work with people in high conflict parenting and co-parenting. And it often comes up between divorced people that they're still punishing each other through the children. Still punishing each other through the children. 
even if they're not bad mouthing the other parent, they make it difficult for the custody schedule to work, or they withhold the children, or they don't pay their child support on time, or they don't give the money that they agreed to in the divorce settlement. Nasty. Of course, that happens with hijackles too. But in so many ways, they're just sustaining that fight that created the divorce. And then they're kidding themselves that it's over. It's so evident in their behavior, but they feel so justified. That's the divided family. That's the family that's living in the past and not living for the best interest and in the best interest and well-being of the children. So what's another way? Your divorce could demonstrate collaboration. What that means is you've likely got some help and you've gotten over each other and over the past wrongs. Or at least you can think yourself straight at moments you're still triggered by them. It means that you do have the best interests of your children at heart, not just the words to make other people think you do. And it also means that you can think in ways that are bigger than yourself and you can accommodate what's best for all concerned. A divorced family that collaborates realizes that everyone benefits from choices made for the best lives in this moment, not predicated on past pain, and they move forward in the best interests of the children. Does that sound good? Is that what you want? I hope so. Again, you're not going to have one with a hijackle, but with any reasonable human being, you can do that. Even if you have a divorce that's going sideways, you can get help that will help you come to a place where you can be mutually respectful and give your children a good example of collaboration. Because a collaborative family of divorce is one in which everyone the divorced parents, the new partners, the grandparents, everyone seeks to provide what is truly in the best interests of the children. It's a child-centered family, one that lives in more than one location, but all contribute to the well-thought-out well-being and health of the children in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. It's a family that works from what is empowering rather than what is exploitative or expedient. Got that? The family is working from what is empowering rather than trying to exploit or get the best of each other in the moment or doing what works in the moment but is not a good long-term strategy. So a collaborative family is usually one that's received some relationship help. So each member regroups in a healthy fashion and proceeds with an empowered life for everyone. Of course, that's a hallmark of emotional maturity. Maybe everybody's not ready to get there, but oh, if they only could. So if your family's divided by divorce and it's not going very well, consider taking some steps to turn it into a family that's collaborating even after divorce. And I'm always here to help you. You know, you can get a first time one hour consultation with me by video conferencing wherever you are in the world at forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R relationship, H-E-L-P.com slash join. And if you want more information, you want to be part of our discussion forums and get it all off Facebook and onto my safe website, go to forrelationshiphelp.com slash E-S-C, Echo Sierra Charlie. That's my emotional savvy circle, forrelationshiphelp.com slash E-S-C. And that will give you access to so much, including my 21 Steps to an Empowered Emotional Savvy email series that's delivered to you over 46 days. So there's so much there for you. I hope that you'll avail yourself of it, get some insights. And also you can find me on YouTube at For Relationship Help. So we're going to talk more about divorce today. We're going to have a great conversation with Jason Levoy and a divorce attorney. That's important information. 
So stay tuned and invite your friends, quickly invite your friends to come on over and listen to or listen at their leisure wherever they prefer to find their podcast. Stay tuned. Want more support? Subscribe to Tips for Relationships at forrelationshiphelp.com slash subscribe now. Hello and welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler and I know you know that already. I have a guest today that is going to talk about divorce and you know that's something that comes up a lot among people who need some emotional savvy because there's going to come a moment when you have to decide, should I stay, should I go? And when you finally have the clarity to make a decision to go, we need people like my guest and my guest is Jason Lavoy. And he is a divorce coach, but he is a reformed divorce attorney. So he has yeah. shifted over there. Welcome to the program, Jason. Thank you. So I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy you're here too. So let me tell you about Jason. I, of course, I'm going to use his words because I want you to know what he wants you to know about him. So he says, I am a former divorce attorney turned divorce coach who helps people with and without attorneys Navigate the divorce system from an attorney's point of view. After practicing family law for a number of years, I quit to become a coach. See, it's hard work. I am the creator of Divorce You, the most comprehensive and affordable divorce resource on the internet. Well, that's very exciting. And, you know, you say something, Jason, I'm going to start off by asking you a question because on your form, you said divorce is nothing more than a business transaction. It's the emotions that get in the way and make it contentious. Oh, that's a big statement. Tell me why you say that. That's a big statement. The question is, do you agree with it or not? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but that's not the point. Tell us why you say that. Well, because from my experience as an attorney, and I'm wearing my attorney hat when I say that, um, divorce, and when you're talking about division of assets and support, the main issues that come up in the divorce, uh, especially when a, a court is dealing with it, um, is when it all comes down to it, we're talking about money in some form, face, or fashion. And uh, so money is business. Uh, and that's why I say divorce is when you really boil it down, nothing more than a business transaction. Now, of course, that is a little bit of an over, oversimplification. Um, really? <laughs> when you're dealing with custody, obviously, that's not a business transaction. No, uh, that's my and, point. <laughs> and the emotions uh, involved in a divorce, which you deal with on your, on your side of things, uh, is not a business transaction. But my point is, from an attorney the emotions really shouldn't be playing a big role in the divorce. The divorce itself is a business transaction. Okay. So we're going to have a big talk about this, Jason. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I deal with high emotions all the time. And I deal with people who are raped and violated by the so-called justice system, which is really just a legal system. So when we say something like this is a business transaction oh would a hijackal ever like that to be true but they don't they it isn't true because they want everything and they want you to have nothing therefore that is not much of a business transaction because it fails to be a negotiation and many times it goes on the divorce proceedings go on too long when you're trying to leave a hijackal and the idea is that the hijacker wants to run the money out. So you can't separate the emotions when you're dealing with a relentlessly difficult person that you're endeavoring to divorce. What do you think? I think, first of all, I loved your term hijacker. Can I just say that? Thank you. Um, ever since I, I first uh, read it and, and heard you uh, talk about it. I love it. Hopefully one day you can come on my podcast and talk about hijackals. I would love that. Sure. But what you said, I don't disagree with, except for the part where what you're describing is the problem with getting divorced and looking at it as a business transaction. The problem is when the emotions get in the way. Um, and again, it's hard. I'm not saying um, it's very hard to separate out emotions 
uh, from the proceedings at hand. But my point is both parties should be focusing on the proceedings at hand and try not to let the emotions get in the way. The problem is when you're referring to the hijackle uh, and manipulating the other person and the process, yes, I agree. That's a big part of the problem. And now the other side, the other spouse has to deal with that. Um, and, but the problem is the hijackle has his or her own, we'll just call them issues. Uh, yeah, that, think. <laughs> it, that it's letting them, it's preventing them from treating the divorce process as a business transaction. So if both parties would treat the divorce as a business transaction uh, and try to limit or eliminate the emotions as much as possible, I, that's what I'm talking about. That's okay. really what it should boil down to. Okay, so I'm going to take issue with that one because I teach negotiation in the MBA program at the University of Texas. And a business transaction is always a negotiation. And when there is a negotiation in court and you have an unfair advantage or you're manipulating or you're lying or you're trying to do something underhanded, you can't help but have emotions in it. And that really is part of a business transaction is being able to manage the emotions and do that in a negotiation. And so when we get to court, often, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, Jason, and maybe you will know something about what you've seen here, is that having gone to court for many of my clients, which I don't do anymore, but having gone to court for them, a hijackal will com uh, I'm tired about it. It upsets me so much. Just they, they will keep firing attorneys until they get a hijackal attorney. And now we've got two of them and they're lying and manipulating and posturing and, and emoting and doing all kinds of things. And we don't even come close to a business transaction that has any level of fairness. So I see and hear that you're separating out fairness from the idea of a business transaction. Is that right? Is that how you can say that it's a it's just a business transaction? Sort of. Again, let me try to dissect you know what you just went over, which was a mouthful. Um, you know, we're not talking about you know black and white issues here. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right as far as you know. Well, I'll call them. I'll use your term, hijackles. They're they, f they will fire multiple attorneys, uh, which is bad, until they find somebody who agrees with them or has their same mindset. And you called it a hijackal attorney. I never thought about it by like that, but they definitely exist. Yes. The attorneys, and I always preach this uh, in my coaching, is that finding the right attorney for your divorce is so important. Um, and, and that goes for both sides, finding the right attorneys together. If you find the, the attorneys can be part of the problem just as much as the solution as they could be and should be part of the solution. Absolutely. Uh, so I, that's number one. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. However, where I might part ways with you a little bit is when we're talking about negotiation. Now, negotiation, and I train on this too, is there's a good way to negotiate and there's not so good ways to negotiate. You negotiate in good faith and you have people who, like you said, negotiate in bad faith, what I would call bad faith, um, and try to manipulate the process and uh, really take it into a place that it shouldn't go. And that's part of the problem. Uh, proper negotiation, I would say, deals with the business at hand. Um, and in order to kind of keep that train on its tracks, you need a few things. You need if you have attorneys involved in the process, you need both attorneys to be on the same page as far as how the negotiation is going to go. If you're using a mediator, um, and I am a trained mediator, but the mediator has to be qualified, not just to mediate, but have the, what's, how should I say, it? the right the right approach uh, to the process. Uh, to keep that negotiation on point uh, because a negotiation, like you said, and I agree with you can derail very quickly. And then you're not talking about what I'm talking about. Um, you're talking about somebody who's manipulating the process and, and using the negotiation like they would try to use the divorce court 
to um, further their cause. But a real negotiation, uh, and especially if you, if you take it out of the, 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 out of the divorce context for a second, let's say two corporations negotiating a deal, um, that negotiation is focused on business and facts and numbers and uh, you know, playing back and forth. There's not a lot of emotion going on there. Um, the problem is with the divorce, you're letting the emotion seep in. And again, that's, that's the problem. People, and you can do it. You just have to train yourself to do it. And you have to have professionals with you on your team who are limiting it as much as possible to keep the emotion out of the process. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question. How many times have you been the divorce attorney for somebody who's divorcing a hijackal? I'd like to say more times than I could count. Okay. And what was your experience with the other side? Were they emotional? The hijackal side or the other side? The hijackal side. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say yes. I mean, when you say emotional, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, vis a um, visible display of, you know, like pulling your hair out and crying and that. I, you can have very um, straight-laced, I would say, narcissists uh, who, to me, it's still emotional, but it's not the outward display of emotion that maybe some people might be thinking about. Okay. So, you know, it's all a bit moot because we all have def different definitions of what emotional would be. But I don't think that you can ever separate the emotion from an interaction with a hijackal. Because even though the uh, hijackal in court may appear to be in control and have their emotions, quote unquote, in control, they are still manipulating the process through the emotional use of language and the telling of the story from their point of view. So, you know, we don't want to belabor the point, but I think there are a lot of things in this in this business about it being a business transaction. If I'm a professional mediator, I have mediated so many divorces. Yes, it's a wonderful time when it's just, let's get this done. But anytime there's a hijackal in there, it's not going to be, let's get this done. It's going to be, let's get this done my way. And well, that makes a big, big difference. So yes, there will be emotion when we are dealing with hijackals, whether it is um, an overt display of emotion. They will get very, very angry. I've seen them stomp and wheeze and huff and puff, oh, sure. like, you know, but I've also seen them be completely cold and steely eyed and, you know, giving people what they call the skank eye. Usually that came in my direction because I was the one who was <laughs> filling the beans, you know. But when you're, de when you're dealing with a divorce in a, a hijackal situation, one of the things that I think people have to do, and they really need to find a good attorney, as you said, Jason, but they need to prepare long before they go to see an attorney. Would you agree? Absolutely. Preparation. I can't stress it enough how important preparation is uh, when you're talking about a divorce. I tell people when I'm lucky enough to meet them, you know, early on before the formal divorce process has begun and anything is even filed in, in court, I stressed to them, I said, you know, you found me at the right time. Now is the time that is going to be the catalyst for everything that follows. And preparation is absolutely 100% essential um, because once things hit the proverbial fan, um, it, it all changes. And then when you're dealing with, uh, a contentious divorce situation or a hijackal situation, um, you want to have as much of your preparation done as possible. Yeah. And you know, my thing, people come to me first of all, to make the decision. Shall I go? Shall I stay? What can I try before I make the decision? And I work with them. I have clients all over the world as you may. Um, do you practice in several States or are you local? I am national. Um, I work with people all over the country um, and I'm able to do that. I'm in New Jersey uh, and I'm a New, uh, New York, New Jersey attorney, but I'm able to work with people nationally because I don't wear my attorney hat. Right. So right. And Which so, is great. 
Yeah, I think I like to think so. I got to walk a fine line. And, uh, you know, I often get tired of saying, you know, just double check the law in your state. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the overall process of getting divorced is universal. Um, and people, especially when you're dealing with emotions and a lot of other things, it's no matter where you're getting divorced, you're going through the same, same type of things. Mm-hmm. And I'm always looking at state law, uh, particularly around one thing, because the state laws vary as to whether or not you can record a conversation without both parties' consent. That and that's a, a very important point to me, because I had this situation. This is how bad it gets, folks. You know, what Jason's talking about from his side, from my side, this is how bad it gets. I was working with a client with two small children who was divorcing a hijackal. And she had a five-year-old and a baby. And her babysitter bailed, so she had to bring them with her one day. And the five-year-old was sitting just outside the consulting room door with his iPad. And he kept insinuating himself inside like a five-year-old would. And he was getting bolder. And I was watching his body language, Chase, and I thought, what's up with this child? So finally, he's looking at me, and he's got the little, what I call, hijackal smirk, you know. The five-year-old? Yeah, he's already got it, right? Oh, no. <laughs> and so he walks up to me finally, after many approximations of coming into the room, and he looks at me, and he said, I've recorded everything you said. And I said, oh, honey, show me your iPad. So he showed it to me, and I said, yes, you did. And I've deleted everything you taped. And he looked at me and I said, now who taught you to do that? My dad told me I have to do that because I have to watch what my mom does. Five years old. Scary. Isn't that scary? And sad. It's so sad. This little guy, no childhood. He's become a spy for his hijackal father. And he's going around trying to record every conversation his mother's in. And I said to her, did you know he was doing this? She said, no, I didn't. I, I have a four-year-old little girl. Uh, and I just, I can't even imagine. His childhood was just ripped from him. You know, he has no childhood when he's having to do adult behaviors and be a confidant of an adult. Oh, it was so sad. So why I'm bringing that up is that I think when people are preparing, from my point of view, what I tell them, and I bet you'll like this, I tell them, document, 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 print the texts, print the emails, download the voicemails, do it all and have it printed out in chronological order. What do you think? You know, Dr. Shaler, I know it sounds like at the beginning, we kind of disagreed with, with each other on a, on a couple of points. <laughs> and I don't think we actually really did disagree. No, I don't think so. But I, I feel like, I don't know, have you, have you been on one of my trainings? <laughs> no. Because you, you, are, you are regurgitating everything that I say. Um, ah, perfect. I, I have, I have a, a, a divorce training I do. It's a free webinar training, how to prepare for divorce or how to, um, and that's part of the training. And I, I, that's, I have like probably three slides that I say, document, document, document. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's true. You, you mm -hmm. have to do it. Now, as an attorney, wearing my attorney hat, I say that with some caution. You want to document and gather as much what I would call objective evidence, because that's what courts want to see, um, as you can. But you got to do so without putting yourself in harm's way, which I'm mm -hmm. sure uh, everybody too, you know, especially when it comes to recording, um, with our, you know, phones these days, you can learn how to record and start the recording process with like two thick, two flicks of your thumb. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do it, but I know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the shortcuts. And if you figure out how to do that, it's a very useful tool, but you obviously want to do it inconspicuously. <laughs> um, because when you're getting into an argument, the last thing you want to do is like, Hold on, I'm recording you. Now let's go. <laughs> but you know, there's, a, there's an upside to that too. Now, I agree with you. If you're in a state that only one pr participant in a conversation needs to know it's being recorded and that's you, you're golden for doing that. But if you're in a state that requires both of them to know that they're being recorded, then you do have to be obvious about it. And I, re I tell people, just say, 
you know, I'm going to record you now. And, 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 you know, they will either say yes or no, or grab your phone or try to do something. But the thing is that when you have that as, no, you're not going to talk to me like that, or I'm going to record it. It's not legal in any way to say it'll stop the person from talking to you like that, but it does put a pattern interrupt in there that they think, oh, I might have been recorded. I don't want to be recorded. No hijacker wants to be recorded. Right. So that becomes very important. But again, make sure that if you are doing it surreptitiously, that your state allows that and it's admissible. But the other thing, piece of that is take a video of things that are happening. When your partner, whether you can hear it or not, say you have a partner who comes to pick up the children and they come three hours late and they're abusive and you're taking video and audio of that and they are throwing things or they're, you know, you, they're obviously angry. These things are very important because it shows the out of control emotion. Whether or not they're being tape recorded is then moot. Right. And um, video, you know, the phrase, a picture speaks a thousand words, and it's true. Um, and divorce judges, at least from my experience, you know, there's nothing worse than being a divorce judge and having to deal with a he said, she, uh, she said situation. You right. know, they don't want to because how do you deal with that? And, and they have to really pick a side on, on who they believe. But if you have a video, if you have other objective evidence uh, that you can use for a judge it, it makes their life so much easier because it's right there yeah it's direct evidence yeah yeah and the whole circumstantial thing you know needs corroboration from somebody and direct evidence well there they are you know keying your car or surreptitiously coming in the back gate and pretending they weren't there you know, I had one client, Jason, that we finally put surveillance cameras all around her home because the guy was coming late at night. Fortunately, now he's in jail, but that's a big story. But he was coming around late at night and he was doing things like coming in the back gate to the property and then pulling all of the um, things to make the pool go stagnant or, you know, just doing gaslighting things to make make my client wonder if she'd failed to do something. But right. he, he was determined to ruin her. Now, fortunately, even though she ended up living in her car by his lies and all, we were able to stick with it and find an attorney would help stick with it. And all the lies and the posturing and everything went on and on. And on. I'm talking two and a half years. And eventually we got to the place where he, what happens with hijackles is they believe they're the smartest person in any room. So they just keep getting more and more bold and bold and bold. And then eventually they do something and they implode. And this is what happened to this fellow. He brought in a witness that he was sure was going to crush the case. And the witness stood up and completely affirmed the uh, partner's point of view, not the hijackal's point of view. Wow. And so he got caught for contempt, for perjury, and for money laundering. Wow. And But many people don't have the time or the money to be in litigation that long. But these are the lengths people will go to. So, so glad that we're talking about this because keep everything preferably keep it in chronological order so you don't come to that moment when you go to the divorce attorney and they say, well, what happened two years ago? Well, I don't know. Right. No. <laughs> you know, you want to have it, put it in a binder, put, you know, and keep yes. it off, off premises. A tab, tab binder, get a, a, a manila folder, something, you know, whatever works for you, mm -hmm. um, but stay organized. I would say you got to be organized and, um, even if it's something, and people don't think about this, but it's better than nothing. If you, keep a journal, um, you know, something that you document mm -hmm. uh, yourself, handwritten journal. It doesn't have to be official. It doesn't have, but if it's something that you could show a judge or even a mediator, uh, mm -hmm. because if you've been doing this a while and you have a lot to document, and you document, like you said, the date, preferably even the time of day and you have detailed notes about what was going on and what happened, you know, what are the odds somebody's going to spend hours and hours making that stuff up on the eve of a hearing? It doesn't happen. No, 
No. So that could also work and be used as evidence, direct evidence. A lot of judges will consider something like that. Yeah, um, and especially too, because you can always tell if somebody's cheating if you really need to, because forensically, you can go and see, if you have it handwritten, you can go and see the dates on when it was written. You know, you can tell by the ink and the paper and all those things if you even have to go to that link. So, so it's really important. I tell people, keep it on your phone under notes. Put some silly name as the title of that particular note and then start documenting. Date, time, what happened? Date, time, what happened? Yeah, if that works for you, whatever, whatever works for you, I say. Um, well, it be, it's because it's at hand. It's right there at that moment. You don't have to go and get a folder. You don't have to do anything. Right. Like, oh, I just got off the phone and this happened. So before we run out of time, Jason, because I think we could talk for a really long time. I think so, too. <laughs> having oh, fun. Me, too. I want to ask you a question because it's, it's important from your side. What's the best way to deal with a spouse who is manipulative and wants to stretch out the divorce process, particularly the litigation process? What's the best thing to do to curtail that? Yeah, and that it's a great question, and it's there's not a, a, a I will not say there's a great answer uh, or not an easy answer, unfortunately, uh, because if one spouse really wants to drag out the process and make your life miserable, there's really limited things as an attorney legally you can do to, to prevent that. But my biggest piece of advice for people is you want to be the one wearing the white gloves in the divorce, uh, at least from the court's point of view. And what and I mean the by white that hat. Is, the white hat, the white gloves. Um, <laughs> I, I use white gloves because I, I use the analogy, you don't want to play in the mud. You know, oh, your, good one. Your, your spouse is, is down there in the dirt, mud slinging and doing what, you know, they do to manipulate you in the process. You do not want to go down there. And it's very easy to, to go down there. Trust me, I know. Um, and I could appreciate that. But from an attorney, if I was your attorney, I'd say, you know, stop it, you know, your spouse, your hijackal, whatever you want to call them, they know how to push your buttons. All right. They probably oh. know better than anybody else. Uh, and you know how to push their buttons. Mm -hmm. So you have to train yourself. Uh, and it's not easy, but you, I think you can train yourself not to react every time they're doing that because that's what oh. they want. And you don't want to dirty your gloves. I so love that it, analogy. That's brilliant, Jason. Great. So everybody get that. Hijackles muds, the hands are dirty, muddy, awful. Their gloves are stained. You want to keep yours clean and pristine. And you can, you absolutely can, because that's what I help people do, is to s observe the hijackle behavior, but don't absorb it. I understand that you have to come from this. And I'll use an example. The other day, someone said, you know, I'm just fed up with my hijackal son and he does this and he does that. So I'm going to text him and, and give him some of his own medicine. What do you think? And I said, oh, I only have one question for you. And she said, what's that? I said, who are you? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, are you a person who behaves like him? Are you a person who would do that? Does that make sense to your values and vision for your life and your beliefs about how to be the best person? Only do that. Don't sink and get into that game. Well, I'll show you how it feels. You will never show a hijackal how it feels because right. they don't care. So know who you are. Go from your values. And if, if you need some elevation, as Jason was saying, you know, learn to play with white gloves. I think that's just a great metaphor. You should go so, out and buy some white gloves and put them on when you're feeling that way. Yeah, <laughs> good not, idea. Remind yourself. You should put that in your divorce you kit. Like here's white the white gloves. gloves. Yeah. That's a good idea. Like a welcome <laughs> box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So great conversation, Jason. I want to tell people about you. This is Jason Lavoy, and he runs Divorce You. And if you want to learn more about Jason, go to jasonlavoy.com. L-E-V-O-Y.com. Jasonlavoy.com. And he has a gift for you. Now we don't we don't um 
go anywhere that causes people not to be able to download our, our podcast because of using language that they don't accept. So he has a gift for you, which beautifully fits. We can still say it. And it's a PDF with tips for how to co-parent with an a-hole. <laughs> I didn't say it. No, we didn't say it. So you get that at Jason Lavoy, L-E-V-O-Y.com slash Shaler, my last name, because you came from the show, S-H-A-L-E-R. And thank you for that. That's a great gift. How to co-parent with an a-hole. Because if you happen to be with a hijackle, you're going to have to do that. Chances. So, <laughs> chances are high. They truly are high. So Jason, any last words, any last word of wisdom, if you're going to go into the divorce process and you know that it's going to be a little less than white glove ready on the other side? What, what I always tell people um, is divorce, a contentious divorce is like a roller coaster. Uh, it's going to have its ups and its downs. So strap yourself in uh, and get ready for a ride because uh, you're probably going to be going on one whether you want to or not. <laughs> yes, you absolutely are. I can attest to that for sure. Well, you want to you want to have the right team with you. Um, that's so important. People like yourself, like a coach or an attorney, um, and uh, the right team will make everything go as I won't say as as good as possible, but it'll make it whatever you're going through. You'll get through it the best way possible with the right team. Yes, I think that's very important. You know, I'm, I have a doctorate in psychology and I'm a professional mediator. And I, pre I practice relationship consulting. And why, not, why am I no longer a psychotherapist? Because I want to be able to give you the straight up goods. I don't want to be able to have or have to be able to say, well, Jason, how do you feel about that? I want to say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to think about. What do you think are your next best steps? No, I don't think that that's going to work for you, and here's why. Right. And I think it's very important to work with a consultant or a coach like you who has high expertise in the divorce world as an attorney and then learn what all the ins and outs of that are because it is not a fair game when you are dealing with a high, highly contentious divorce, as you say, or the other side is hijackal. Um, it just doesn't work very well. So thanks so much for being with us, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. I had a, it was a great discussion, I think. Uh, I think so, too. I'm Georgia Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. I just want to bring you guests that are going to give you the help and the insights and the information you need right away to have instant access to have the best experience possible, even if you're going through the worst one. So I'm glad you were here. If you enjoyed this, bring a few friends along with you. You can download my other podcast, Save Your Sanity, Help for Handling Hijackles, just as you can with Emotional Savvy, wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. I look forward to talking with you soon. Take care. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy.